Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Terry Schellenberg. I serve CMU as Vice President External. And on behalf of our faculty, our students, and our staff, I want to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you. Welcome to CMU and welcome to Face to Face, the second in our series this academic year of conversations in which we invite our faculty, our students, and invited guests to engage in issues that are of community significance, issues that are at the intersection of faith and of life. This evening's conversation, which falls just prior to next week's National Restorative Justice Week, is entitled Restorative Justice, Soft on Crime or Building Community Security. While you will listen this evening, you will also be invited to be in conversation about an issue that has resonance in and relevance to much that happens in our broader community. And guiding us through the evening is uh, David Balser, CMU Assistant Professor of Communications and Media. Again, we're very pleased that you've joined us. Please, David. Well, welcome here as well. I, uh, I feel so incredibly privileged to be uh, moderating and hosting this discussion. And uh, I, I love this role because I don't have to know as much as they know in order to <laughs> fulfill my role. I just get to enjoy facilitating the content. So I, uh, I will be your host for this evening. And I'm gonna just say a few words of introduction around this issue and then I will introduce our panel members and our faculty member, and then we will uh, jump into conversation. The format is such that we will have about 10 minutes from each of our panel members, and, uh, and then invite after each one has spoken for you to engage with them for a couple minutes to clarify their, uh, their presentation. And then once they've all had a chance to present and we've been able to interact with them a little bit, then we should have about a half an hour at the end for a larger group conversation. So this is really intended to facilitate conversation. They have lots more to say than 10 minutes, but uh, we, uh, we've uh, limited them to that. Uh, we've limited them to those 10 minutes so that we can have time to talk together. On March 12, 2012, Parliament passed a bill, C-10. This was an omnibus crime bill that included mandatory minimum prison sentences for drug offenders, harsher penalties for violent crimes and sexual assault, provision allowing victims of terrorism to sue perpetrators more easily, and the list goes on. The rationale that was given at that time largely was linked to safer communities and greater support for victims. In, in a report by the CDC in November of 2013, Maureen Brosnahan stated the following, it costs an average of $110,000 a year to house a male inmate, and nearly twice that to imprison a female. She went on to describe that over the past five years, the Correctional Service of Canada budget has increased 40% to $2.6 billion a year. When Correctional Investigator of Canada Howard Sapers tabled his report in late 2013, he said the following, quote, you cannot reasonably claim to have a just society with incarceration rates like these. And yet Brosnahan reports that national crime rates are at their lowest in over a decade. So is incarceration in fact working? This past spring, the government of Manitoba's then Justice Minister Andrew Swan proposed legislation that would create a framework to expand community-based justice programs to quote, increase public safety and reduce crime. Interestingly enough, a very similar rationale to Bill C-110. And tonight we have this conversation on the eve of National Restorative Justice Week, which begins in a couple days on November 16. An exceptional array of local events are happening. Menno Simons College uh, of CMU is one of many sponsors, uh, mediation services and others that are beginning next Wednesday to Friday and a national symposium in Banff is happening next week with Dr. Howard Zare, who some call the godfather, the founder of and leader of restorative justice. He's the keynote. Clearly there's a growing conversation around crime and punishment, 
with a heightened sense of awareness of the complexity of the questions and possible solutions. CMU is very privileged to have these presenters here tonight to help us explore what role does incarceration, punishment, and restorative justice play in building security? Is restorative justice effective in ensuring accountability for wrongdoing or violence? Are punishment and incarceration helping us to build more secure communities? I'll introduce each of our guests now so that our conversation can flow uninterrupted. We will begin with Wendy Craker, who's sitting right here. She's instructor in peace and conflict transformation studies here at CMU. We've invited her as a faculty member to provide us with a succinct framework of definitions and understandings around some of these terms we're going to be using tonight. And uh, we're very delighted that she uh, can do that. Wendy comes with a specialization in community conflict transformation processes. She spent over 15 years of work as a community mediator, as a conflict transformation trainer. This work has taken her literally around the globe to places like the Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, India, Bangladesh, and more recently Palestine, where she's come alongside of indigenous groups, NGOs, community and religious leaders, and educators. She's trained in theology and is uh, currently in the Peace Studies program, a PhD program at the University of Manitoba. She and her partner Gordon Zerbe have two children and all of them are very active in the CMU community, to say the least. Jay Young Lee on the far left. Uh, we are very uh, pleased that he uh, chose to come from Seoul, South Korea for this event tonight. And we must say at the outset that that was a tongue-in-cheek joke. We actually need to thank Mennonite Central Committee. Uh, who have sponsored him to come for their 50th anniversary with a, uh, a wonderful event. He's the keynote speaker this Saturday, and I really invite you to participate in those festivities on Friday. And uh, they have graciously allowed us to include him in this event tonight. He's a restorative justice specialist. He's a pioneer in the field in uh, South Korea since 2000. He's conducted mediation training in schools, government uh, offices, NGOs, and churches. He's the executive director of the Northeast Asia Regional Peace Building Institute and a whole array of peace institutes with the word Asia in them um, uh, in and around South Korea. He graduated from a precursor college of CMU, Canadian Mennonite Bible College, went on to do master's studies at Eastern Mennonite University and has since been involved back in his home in South Korea with this work. He's married to Karen Spicher and they have two daughters. Bob Christmas, without the T, is a Winnipeg police officer. He's been a, is now a staff sergeant, has been with the service for over 25 years. He's been on the front lines of police work here in the city, major case management, crisis mitigation. He's an author, a researcher, and teacher. He's currently working on a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Manitoba. When he published his recent book in 2013 entitled Canadian Policing of the 21st Century, the Winnipeg Free Press described Bob as, quote, the new face of change in the Winnipeg Police Service. And we're very delighted to have Bob with us tonight. Lisa Pomerat is a victim offender mediation participant and a victim advocate. The trajectory of Lisa's life was radically altered days before her birth with the murder of her father, Alan Pierce, in a home invasion in 1976 on a family farm in Mooseman, Saskatchewan. Lisa was born 13 days later into the chaos precipitated by a senseless, violent crime. She and, uh, observed her mother and experienced her mother go through depression and illness and eventually a process of forgiveness. Over the years, Lisa has wanted to find meaning in this murder and also wondered about her, who her father was and who the perpetrator of the crimes were. Through soul searching, hard work and writing, and eventually a process of healing, she encountered through mediation the man who shot her father. She's joined us here tonight to uh, graciously share some of her story of healing, her work with Pay It Forward, at Stony Mountain Penitentiary that brings community members and inmates together. And she has experienced our question from both the criminal justice system side and 
the restorative justice side. So thank you, Lisa, for being willing to come tonight. So let's begin. I will invite you to be candid and forthright in your questions. This is your conversation. We want to do that. I will keep drawing us back into generous hospital, hospitable conversation. And as I mentioned, we'll have about 15 minutes uh, with each of our guests, and then we will open it up for further conversation. So let's have a good conversation. I don't think we'll solve this question in the next uh, 80 minutes or so, but uh, we do well for the sake of our communities and for the sake of our society to have a very necessary conversation. So Wendy, would you please come and uh, help us define these words so we know what we're talking about. Thanks, Dave. And maybe I'll just add as a correction, the event for MCC is here on this campus on Saturday. So don't come on Friday for that. There are other things to come for on Friday, but Saturday is the MCC event here. Thank you all for coming. Great to see your faces here. And I now have five minutes to give you a one semester course in restorative justice. So I'm probably going to speak fairly quickly to cram in as much as I can in the five minutes that I have. So tonight we are concerned with the questions of how should we as a society respond to wrongdoing? And what needs to happen when wrongdoings take place? So our guests, Jay, Bob, and Lisa, are going to guide us in considering these questions from their experiences, their studies, their practice. And I've been asked to put some of these terms and frameworks together for you so that you get a sense of the foundation for their discussion and they can just launch into the kind of issues that they would like to speak about. So let me begin by saying that the Western judicial system has some important strengths. But there are also some grave limits and even failures and the field of restorative justice, or RJ, as at least I know Jay is going to refer to it as, so restorative justice, or RJ, attempts to address some of these needs and limitations. So think of restorative justice as a compass. It is not a map, it is a compass that guides us. And the modern field of restorative justice begins in the early 1970s and Mennonites were certainly very active participants within the origins of that. But as we sit here tonight on Treaty One land, it should be acknowledged that Native principles have long held their roots in restorative justice practices. And we have been greatly influenced by those, by our current questions have been greatly influenced by those practices. Howard Zare, who has been referred to as the godfather even by Dave, the father of restorative justice, wrote two classic books that if you're not familiar with, you can use to follow up in this field, Changing Lenses and the Little Book of Restorative Justice. And he defines RJ as this, a process to involve, to the extent possible, those who have a stake in a specific offense, and to collectively identify and address harms, needs, and obligations in order to heal and put things as right as possible." End of quote. The criminal justice view of wrongdoing is that crime represents a violation to the law and the state. The RJ view is that crime is a violation of people and relationships. And as a result of these different viewpoints, there are three different sets of questions that can be asked. The criminal justice system will ask, what laws have been broken, who did it, and what do they deserve? And we're very familiar with these questions. We've grown up with these questions. And we are also very familiar from watching probably mostly American TV, the professionals that ask these kinds of questions. Now, RJ asks three questions. Who has been hurt? What are their needs? And 
whose obligations are these to meet those needs? So these questions might be a bit more unfamiliar. And these questions, in certain contexts within our judicial system, are starting to be asked, both in Canada and in Korea, but not perhaps far enough. And these questions are not just for the judicial system, but they are for you, the community, which is why we are glad that you are here this evening. The RJ process focuses not only on those participants whose offenses we might address, but also the victims and the larger community. So what is the foundation of RJ? It has three pillars. It focuses on harms and needs, because far, hope focusing on harm implies a concern for victims' needs and roles and seeking to repair that harm as much as possible. Secondly, it emphasizes offender accountability and responsibility. There are obligations that the offender must learn to understand. Lastly, RJ promotes engagement for those impacted by the wrongdoing. So that's victims, that's offenders, that's members of the community. And all of these stakeholders need to be part of the decision of how to move forward from wrongdoing. So the questions of who is involved in this process and how they are involved is a significant part of the RJ process. There is incredible breadth of options that are available in terms of addressing who and how. And these are some of the things that we're going to hear from our guests tonight as they share their journeys that have taken them to places where they have needed to grapple with these questions and discern what their roles are within these situations. So you sit here tonight as one of the stakeholders in this very important conversation of how society can engage and should engage in the quest for restoration. Putting things right means that harms need to be addressed, but it also means that causes leading to these harms need to be addressed. And one of the questions that emerges within the field is whether this is an either or situation. Is it restorative justice versus retributive justice? These are not really polar opposites. Both acknowledge that a balance has been upset with the wrongdoings that have been done. But they do offer different suggestions in terms of how to right that balance. So I invite you to hear the stories and learnings of our three speakers and wonder together with them about the directions forward and the questions that need to be pursued as we consider the options for justice available to us. Thanks, and I look forward to the conversation. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm nervous tonight because my first English teacher at CNBC, sitting right there, <laughs> was teaching me English. And also, Ashneyboy Park was where I study English. I cannot say details, but that's where I study English. So I'm glad and nervous to uh, standing here presenting what uh, we're doing in Korea. And as you see here, um, I prepare a PowerPoint to help your understanding. And it's merely from a practitioner's perspective. Although I studied a restorative justice uh, under Howard Zare, who's coming next week, um, it, it was an adventure for me because I couldn't follow anybody in Korea, so I had to start something from my own understanding. And now it become my passion. So I hope not from my uh, ability of speaking in English, but I hope I can speak to you with my passion from my heart. Let me start with the, the, some organizations that I uh, work with. Uh, Korea Peace Building Institute, it's, I'm uh, charged for now, and it is the, one of the leading organizations for restorative justice in Korea. Uh, another one that we just started and also I'm charged for is Korea Association for Restorative Justice. 
and this is the uh, legal body that we try to include more people to join our restorative justice movement. And another uh, piece of work that I'm doing, and Wendy is also part of it, is Northeast Asia Regional Peace Building Institute. And in that uh, work, uh, we try to put restorative approach to even historical conflict. So it sounds big, but we try to start from somewhere with the, this understanding of restorative justice. Um, I have to explain first why I work in the restorative justice. I want to see and live in the safe and peaceful community society as everybody wanted. Um, I want to raise my children where they go to school and instead of coming crying, frustrating, angry, but learn how to deal with the conflict in more productive, constructive ways. As Wendy shared, in my practice, I start meeting victims and I realized the victim's needs are not usually met and their needs are ignored in great deals. So I want to see society can respond to the victim's needs. I think we'll hear from Lisa later on. Um, as I shared, I have a passion for historical reconciliation between Japanese and Korean, between Chinese and Japanese, between North and South Koreans. I hope and pray one day Korea will become one country from these divided countries and political unification will be much easier than people's unification. At that time, we might need a different understanding and paradigm of how to build justice issue and work on the reconciliation. So that's why I'm interested in this. Also, uh, I'm, I was Christian and now I'm Mennonite. So I don't know what's the difference, but <laughs> uh, it's from my faith uh, convention too. I want to uh, live and work as a Christian who uh, practice uh, discipleship, which is also based on peace and justice uh, that we learn from Jesus Christ. So justice, uh, my simple understanding uh, is to make right relationship. When I read the MCC statement, it says that very clearly, do good or work to make right relationship with the others' natures. So to me, justice can be defined as many ways, but how we can make right relationship. So that is the key word to me. Peace. Um, peace can be misused in many ways. When I served in the military as a Marine, I was doing my military duty for peace. Some people dropped the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that was for peace. Many different forms and understandings are going on, and when I heard peace, uh, I was thinking that there's something missing and I think it's because of our understanding of peace. The Korean language words peace uh, means from the Chinese character and if you see the uh, Chinese character, it says equal distribution of rice. So every mouse has equal rice that is peace. So from the beginning, uh, my understanding of peace has a strong ties with justice. So to me, just peace building is very important, the, the understanding of peace. Third point, the key points of restorative justice, truth and reconciliation. I was very happy to hear that there is a truth and reconciliation commission uh, has been do done or doing in Canada, which wasn't when I was here. I was in the native reservation for four months when I was at CNBC. And it was very good to hear that if an injustice done in this land, there's a way to deal with it. And when I live with the native people, one good understanding that I learned was when they talk about justice on wrongdoings, they always associate the language with the healing. 
So justice, yes, we need it, but for what? Toward what? That is very key. And uh, my understanding is restorative justice, which attract me in that how we bring truth, but at the same time how we can achieve reconciliation and healing. So before I learned restorative justice, these two words are opposite words. It was not getting along well. But in my practice, I slowly understand that there is possibilities. So it's a struggle, but it's still some signs of hope. Um, my understanding of re reconciliation, it has an image of walking together. In, in the words, in the language, Tongheng. So we walk together. Um, and to me, in order to walk together from the people who divided or opposite side or harm each other, I think the great, uh, the work has to be done from both sides. We cannot work with only one side. We need to work with the both sides so that this walking together can be possible with the people who are around them and support them. I think that's a great role for community. Um, these are the five elements that uh, we often uh, say in, in our workshop uh, because oftentimes people's question is not about justice but what do you mean by restorative? What do you mean by restoration? So these five keywords, harm, responsibility, uh, relationship and community and justice, these are the five important elements to be restored. Whether we have victim offender dialogue or circle or any form of restorative justice work, I think these are the five very important checkpoints that we are actually heading into that. So, um, in our practice I want to just share a little bit of uh, our work. Uh, I mentioned that from 2000, we started involved in this uh, new idea of restorative justice. Um, and then uh, there was an approach from a Research Center for Criminal Justice, it's a government-run institute. And they found us somehow and then asking us to have an experimental project together on uh, uh, crime cases, especially juvenile cases. So we agree and uh, we start having this uh, victim offender dialogue. Uh, so we got cases from a uh, police uh, court and other uh, institutes. So we start to having this victim offender dialogue. And it wasn't easy and it's still not easy. But uh, we at least provide a venue where they can face each other and share about their stories, which often not being hurt from the other side. Um, reconciliation, healing can be one of outcomes, but we are not request or we are not expect. We just provide a safe venue where they can at least come and share. Uh, finally, Seoul Family Court uh, accept our uh, proposal and uh, they passed a new law, so that now there's a victim offender uh, reconciliation program is officially uh, set in the legal system. And now all over the country at the family court, you can access this program. And there are hundreds of mediators are doing this work with us. Um, in this process, uh, because we're dealing juvenile cases, uh, schools, education of uh, Department of Education approached us that uh, we like to use this restorative methods to school conflict. So, of course, we were welcomed and uh, we worked together. And uh, as a result of that, um, Gyeonggi province, that's where our office and our uh, houses are, and it's the biggest province, it's, it's, it's a province that surrounds Seoul. Um, they uh, accepted restorative discipline as an official approach to school discipline from this year. So we are very happy that this new movement is coming into 
and I share that uh, we start the uh, this uh, agent. So I will sh share some of our work with you. Uh, we school criminal justice system and the community. That's where we work with. And these are the, some pictures that uh, what we're doing as a program, as a uh, workshop they are working on. And as you see here, sometimes we go to schools and uh, involved in this uh, fight. Usually minor cases, but again, it can be a serious if they continue in growing in this environment. Uh, adults, teachers also come and they also share their ideas and opinions. Uh, we also involved in this uh, uh, victim offender dialogue at school level, but this uh, families are often in the uh, legal process already, but we do that in the uh, inside. We just try to solve in the school level, community level. Um, it's not easy work. It's sometimes very tiring. As this uh, picture shows, I finish at one o'clock in the morning. I don't know how I got home, but Yes, <laughs> sometimes it takes a lot of times and efforts. Uh, these are the pictures that uh, we done in the police station, and it's because of victims' request. They are willing to meet, but they request they has to be in the police station, and police has to wait in the next room. This is the great fear still as they walk into here. But as they talk and face, the things can change. Um, these are the picture of the, what we're doing at the court level. Um, and I don't have uh, all time to share stories, but our focus is how to help the victims, how to empower them. So again, it's, it's try to meet the victim's needs. That's how we do. And this is a picture that we do in the prison when there's a murder and a, a victim who lost their family members. We had a program five days of program and they gather and they share their stories. It's the healing journey for them, but it's very painful reality that they have to face. Yeah, these are the trainings and stuff and um, thank you for listening. <laughs> Sorry for the wrap, but uh, what I want to share is it's not only easy and uh, health, uh, hopeful, but uh, I just want to share the last piece that uh, RJ approach question with the, is this soft on crime or not? And this uh, James, uh, chief uh, police from Hull City, Hull City has known the restorative city, as you read here, his experience is no, this is not soft on crime, but it is a way that the offenders can take voluntary responsibility from the very early stage. So there is hope, and I'm not saying that this is the only way, but I think we need a balance between criminal justice and restorative justice, and we need both, and we need a great deal of work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. We have a couple minutes right now. Would you like to follow up with further clarification or just extending something that you heard uh, Jay Share, uh, we'll, we'll take that time right now. There's two microphones here. Don't be shy, just step up to the microphone and ask a question, and then uh, we'll move to our next presenter. But we want to just take a couple minutes right now if you have uh, something you'd like to follow up on. Any questions? Uh, we'll have time later to uh, put, pose questions to all of them. Bob, why don't you uh, take us into your story? Thanks for having me again. This is a beautiful building. I used to come here when I was a kid. It was a uh, when it was a deaf school. I went to Shaftesbury just down the street. So I think all the uh, deaf kids in Manitoba probably resided here at one point or another. Um, I'm not an expert in restorative justice, but I guess I could say safely that I'm an expert in policing just by virtue of the fact that I've hung around and worked in the system for over 30 years. And I've focused most of my grad studies on policing and justice issues. So I have thought. Not working? Oh, thanks. No, where was I? 
<laughs> um, so this was billeted as more of a discussion, and so I decided to come unscripted and just uh, see if I can react to some of the issues as they come up. And in fact, two major points did come up in the first couple of uh, points of discussion that I'd like to just hit on for a few minutes. One is the effectiveness, uh, your question about the effectiveness of the prison system. And the other one is restorative justice itself and, uh, and what role it might play. Um, I think uh, the criminal justice system leaves a lot to be desired and it has many gaps, many uh, areas for improvement across the country. Uh, just a point of example is the outcomes that we're seeing in Manitoba. Um, Manitoba's prisons are bursting at the seams and 70% or more of, our, of Manitoba's inmates are Aboriginal, so there's something hugely wrong there for a small portion of our population to be such a large representation in our prison system. Youth recidivism is about 80%, and most of those are Aboriginal kids, so clearly there's some issues that need addressing in our system, but I'm happy to say that a lot of people are working hard to try and correct that. Just a little further on that point, the demographic is similar uh, as far as Aboriginal issues in Saskatchewan. And Aboriginal people are generally overrepresented over in the prison systems across Canada. Um, not to belabor the point, but it's clearly an, an issue that Canada has been struggling with and we need to do a lot more work on. And restorative justice, I believe, holds principles uh, that should lead towards the correction of some of those issues. The point that I wanted to make about restorative justice is that, as I've heard it referred to by the first few speakers, was responding more to crime and offenses after they've happened. And a point that I want to make is that I think that there is a deeper principle in the idea of restorative justice, and that's in crime prevention and building community resilience. And on that front, I'm happy to speak uh, about what's happening in Manitoba and most places across Canada are in a trend right now where they're working towards crime prevention as opposed to reacting to crime. And it sounds like almost a ludicrously simple example, but I've often used the medicine example. Like looking to the police and the justice system to correct uh, crime problems is like looking to doctors to solve lung cancer, you know, by responding and treating it as an illness once it's developed. By the time a kid joins a gang and gets involved in criminal activity, he's already been down a long road in most cases where they could have been intervened with uh, at any point along the way, long before they get involved with the police and the justice system. And I think there's roles in this massive justice system with all its resources to play bigger parts in prevention. And this is where I'm focusing my research for my PhD and uh, my current chief of police has uh, embraced the idea of crime prevention through social development. So we're looking to partner and work more on the public safety aspect of policing and justice rather than the crime investigation and reaction aspect. We still have to investigate crimes and respond to them appropriately uh, and effectively, but there's a much bigger role that all these resources can play in crime prevention. So we're uh, in the Winnipeg Police Service, for example, we're getting involved in uh, seeking partnerships that never existed before, getting involved in things that the police wouldn't be caught dead uh, doing in the past uh, because it was hard to justify, but now it's more understood that if we don't do something about crime before it festers into crime problems and our prisons are bursting, then it's an unsustainable uh, trajectory and we can't live with it. The, uh, the Attorney General in uh, Saskatchewan just recently put the kibosh on building a brand new prison complex that they were building and put that money into crime prevention instead. And that's a trend that we're seeing all across Canada. And I think that's a deeper principle of restorative justice that we need to all play a part as a community in 
crime prevention and preventing these crime problems from occurring. In Winnipeg, we have a few excellent projects underway. One of them is the uh, Boldness Project. It's $7 million funded half by government and half by the McConnell Foundation, and they're investing that in the Point Douglas area in early childhood development, trying to get kids off on the right foot in life. And the police are involved in supporting that. We have wraparound approaches having it happening for gang members and violence-involved youth at the Health Sciences Center. We're fully supportive of, uh, of that research and trying to support it in any way we can. Um, we're seeking partnerships to try and build community, but what a lot of people don't realize is uh, although we, the police and the justice system has a very high profile, the police are actually a very small player in, a, in the spectrum of services that can play a part in crime prevention. Um, for example, in Winnipeg, within the city limits, uh, in the city police, we have about 1,500 members. There's 30,000 people working in the health industry in Winnipeg. So I think they have a lot, possibly a much bigger role to play in crime prevention. Um, I say the police and the justice system are shifting more towards preventive approaches and community building approaches, but it's not a new idea. It's something that we've come back to historically over and over again. And these are uh, shifts that happen in cycles, I found, um, as community demands change. I wrote a lot about that in my book. Uh, I found even uh, challenges with crime prevention initiatives that are tied to political cycles, where politicians are challenged to uh, invest large resources into programs that will take many years beyond their tenure in, in office to show results. But short-term uh, fixes we found are, are resulting in unsustainable trajectories that we need to address. So I think that that's, that's why there's a need for greater research that can show the value of putting money and resources into crime prevention and community building rather than reacting to crime. Regarding uh, actual restorative justice and integrating it with the Western uh, justice system, as Wendy called it, um, there are some fundamental challenges, and I'll just throw up a couple of points that maybe we can discuss. One of them, the, uh, the Western justice system is really designed to stop people from talking the way it operates in Canada. If a person's charged with a major crime in Canada, they have a right to obtain a lawyer and generally they'll get advice to not speak to the victim for sure and not speak to people about the offense that's occurred. So automatically when a major incident happens, people are separated and kept from talking together. That's an a impediment to restorative justice uh, and I'm not sure how we can overcome that. The uh, Western society is a low context culture where individual rights are protected over the value of, of the community, whereas the restorative justice uh, principles really grew in communities where high context cultures live in fairly homogenous ways. So how do we integrate those principles in a, in a diverse community like Winnipeg? I don't know. Like, do we offer, does the system get adjusted um, to address specific people? Uh, do they get the advantage of certain processes and resources and others don't? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but there are challenges and I can bring some examples if, uh, if people raise a question, but I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Any uh, follow-up at this point? Go ahead. I'm glad to hear the emphasis you're making on prevention. However, that doesn't seem congruent with what I'm hearing politically, particularly on a national level. Uh, the focus seems much more on incarceration uh, than on prevention and working the way you're suggesting. 
Yeah, I'm proud to say that I hit on that when I was writing my book. Uh, the idea of hitting hard on crime and giving people stiffer sentences really puts us on a, a deepening trajectory towards an ineffective system, in my opinion. We're following in the footsteps when we do that of the Americans who have gone down that path and they've learned and they're trying to, t they're trying to turn back. Um, for decades in the U.S., they, they went with stiffer penalties and building bigger jails. And uh, We all know that it's a great uh, political statement to put more police on the street and build bigger jails, but that's not what the community needs to actually prevent crime from festering. Uh, Canada's been heading that way, but uh, in some communities there's a growing awareness that it's not an effective uh, solution. And so I know in Manitoba, for instance, they just recently restructured the Justice Department to a community safety department, and they're really focusing on crime prevention. The Winnipeg Police Service is putting major resources into crime prevention as opposed to just reacting to crime and saying that certain issues are other departments' responsibilities. Um, something I've argued and I think most people now in key positions of power are agreeing with that uh, we need to share responsibility, responsibility for these issues and not try to always uh, act in a liability-based way and point the finger at other agencies. So when we do that, victims get lost between systems and lost in, in policy gaps. Um, so we need to own responsibility for these things and share responsibility and act together, walk together, as Jay said. I, I really like the way he highlighted that. Um, so I agree. If putting, building bigger prisons and giving stiffer penalties is ineffective and it's a wrong trajectory unless the right programming is put in place to help people so that there is no recidivism. But we know that recidivism rates right now are quite high. Does that answer your question? Okay. Bob, can you just, we got just a minute or two, can you just comment on what would be the motivation within the larger political movements to, uh, you know, I mean, some of the, these numbers of that $2.6 billion budget, 2,700 new cells, uh, or 7,200 new cells, sorry, was primarily what generated that increase in budget. So clearly there's some people who do believe in incarceration. What, what's pushing that agenda forward if it seems so obvious as you say that it's ineffective? I can't answer that. <coughs> I, don't, I thought maybe you could, <laughs> so I just... Um, I don't know why... Mind. There seems to be opposing views on this in different areas. Um, the, uh, the Prime Minister recently commented that uh, crime is not a social issue. I, that really struck a lot of people in the justice community and uh, people working in the area is uh, perplexing because we're recognizing that these are all social issues and, and the only way that we're going to stop crime from growing is by addressing the root causes and working together in preventive ways. Lisa, let's uh, turn to your story. Okay. Um, hi, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my dad, Alan Pierce, was murdered in a home invasion that was being committed in his parents' home on June 12, 1976, on the family farm outside of Musselman, Saskatchewan. I was born 13 days later, one day after what would have been his 33rd birthday. The two men were apprehended within hours and were convicted of secondary murder within six months. My mom, Carol, had a 20-month-old and newborn, a farm to run that she'd only lived on for three years that she'd been married and the trial. Pre-existing mental illness, the adrenaline rush and trauma, along with pregnancy hormones, ex caused extreme havoc in her body that led to PTSD, postpartum depression, and autoimmune diseases. The doctors agreed that it also contributed to terminal cancer. She passed away in December of 2010, one week before her 69th birthday. For me, to some degree, she was another victim 34 and a half years later. 
I grew up in a very confusing environment. I learned the majority of what happened to my dad from a newspaper article given to me by a teacher when I was nine. We moved when I was 13 and I noticed that there was a new picture on the shelf and I asked who the man was. It's your dad, she mumbled while hunched over a sink full of dishes. I don't think she hid it from me maliciously, she just didn't know what to do. And even when she did know, she just couldn't quite always follow through. It was years before she told me the story from her perspective, and then it was in bits and pieces. At the same time that I was growing up in confusion, my mom was speaking at churches and women's group about forgiveness and telling her story. She was a front runner in restorative justice in Manitoba. In 1984, through our pastor and the prison chaplain, she made contact with Richard, the accomplice in our case. They met in and out of prison and wrote back and forth until she passed away. I met him at Stony Mountain when I was 12 and he visited our house when, he, when I was 15. My mum had written to Randy, the man who shot my dad, and had one letter in response but that was it. We didn't know if he was or if he, where he was or if he was still alive. I spent my 20s trying to push it all away and to forget. All it did was make me more angry and confused. So when I turned 30 I realized that I had a date coming towards me. June 13th, 2009, the date that I would surpass my dad's age when he died. It was very significant to me. I can't live out the rest of my dad's life, but I can live my life in a way that he would be proud of. He had died defending his family, and I didn't want his sacrifice to be in vain. So I dug in to find meaning and purpose in his death. I spent a year thinking, writing, and soul searching. I thought about what my dad would have wanted, and I knew he wouldn't have wanted us to live in anger and bitterness and only seeing the negative. I wanted to understand who these people were on both sides of the gun. At the end of that year, I found Randy through the parole board and a year after that, I was, went to his parole hearing. He'd been out several times but took off and was put back in several times. He was on the road to making a change for the better but had a long way to go. I wrote an 11-page impact statement stating that I forgave him and that my dad wouldn't want revenge, but still making a point of what had happened because of his crime. He had made bad choices, but he had the power to make better ones. A year later, I had the opportunity to go through mediation with him. Randy said that he was prepared for someone to come in and yell at him, but I wasn't interested in yelling. I wanted understanding for both of us. I told him that his upbringing gave me understanding for what he did, but it didn't excuse it. I posed it this way. You were abused as a child, so you got into trouble and it came to murder. That murder hurt me and my family. So now does that give me the right to go out and commit a crime? No, it doesn't. That's when I started to see the change in him. He asked me for advice about his daughter, and I told him that he knew, to, he knew the choices that he had to make to have a relationship with her and to hang on to the hope of that relationship. It wasn't easy to sit across from him, and I did see a flash of his former self, but the power had shifted in our relationship. I had no fear of him. I now felt sorry for him. My mom saw a video tape of his apology, and her reaction of anger told me that it had been the right thing for me to do to see him myself. She wasn't ready, and I never expected her to be. A year and a half ago, I went to another parole hearing. He'd come a long way. He had a relationship with his daughter and grandson, he had a family, and when asked by one of the parole board's members what had helped him find his way, he said his daughter, the church connections, one of his drug counselors, and my kindness. That was powerful. It felt like my whole life had been leading to that moment. I was so overwhelmed I could barely breathe. He said that he finally knew at almost 60 years old what he had done because he finally had a family and couldn't imagine something happening to them. Randy's daughter was finishing school to work with intellectually challenged, which he helped pay for. He was no longer defined by murder. In the end, this is not about me or what I've done. This is about what can be accomplished when you listen to and allow God to work out his plan. Above all, this is his story. Crime creates a power imbalance. For me, restorative justice is about working to restore the balance of power, and that is what I feel we accomplished. But I will say that this is very rare. The formula has to be right and the people have to be ready. The situation can't be forced. 
There is an enormous amount of work that goes into restorative justice, and most days I'm still working on it. It isn't a switch that can be flipped. There is a lot of pressure on victims to get over it, forgive, and restore. They can't do it alone, and they need help if they are going to begin to restore the balance of power. I will also say that even if the balance of power is restored, it doesn't mean that the victim is restored. Those are two very different things. Some victims will never get there, and that also needs to be okay. Our cur current criminal justice system needs a lot of work. Yes, people need to be held accountable for their actions, and there are some offenders who are best kept out of society long term, and some permanently. Not every inmate will be receptive or capable of rehabilitation, and public safety is paramount. Being held accountable doesn't mean have to mean a completely punitive system which is what I see our country moving towards. Offenders need to understand the impact of their actions to be rehabilitated. Aside from the physical incarceration, I believe work programs, mental, phys spiritual, and emotional work is also important so that they have a chance to move past the bad choices and understand that they have the ability to make better choices. And those better choices can start in prison. Bringing hope and a positive atmosphere, helping people to see that they can belong to something other than a gang or a cell block. That was my motivation for joining the Pay It Forward pro project at Mount Stony Mountain. Once a month, we as community members, I was the only victim in the group, would go in and meet with inmates in a group setting. We were able to discuss our views openly and honestly, and in the end, you could hardly tell who was who in the answers. A solely punitive environment make me, might make the outside community feel secure and safe, but I believe it is a false security past a certain point. Whether we like it or not, the majority of the people inside are going to be released to live in our community. The question that came to me when I started my journey was, would I rather have people coming out who are feeling more isolated and angry, or people who can contribute to society in a positive way? I, for one, want contributors, and in my opinion, the way to have contributors is to give people hope and a sense of belonging. That isn't always going to be achieved through the direct victim-offender mediation, and it isn't always possible. As a community, we need to step up in place of the victims who can't speak for themselves to make a difference. Crime affects all of us, whether through taxes or on a personal level, so we all need to be involved in the solution to stop the cycle of violence. I truly believe that helping victims heal, especially children, is the best place to start to end that cycle. Working with and helping victims is preventative. Changing the prison system is reactive. Ironically, you said that. Um, teaching kids accountability, responsibility, and consequences, as well as forgiveness and understanding, is a great way to start. Reach out to the kids in the community. Find out the story behind the issue. Is the kid who is bullying being abused? Let's stop the us versus them mentality. I have seen enough to know that there is a very fine gray line between looking out and looking in through the prison bars. By getting involved, you may be preventing a crime in your own family. If it can happen to a kind and loved 32-year-old rural farmer, it can happen to almost anyone. Now imagine if Canada had had the death penalty in 1976. Randy's only legacy would have been murder. Instead, his legacy lives on in a daughter, making a positive change in her community and raising his son to hopefully do the same. It's about breaking the cycle and restoring the balance. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisa. We will uh, shift at this point. Uh, you can direct questions directly to Lisa in response to what she's just said, but uh, let's move right as well into uh, open conversation. Do you have a question you'd like to pose to uh, all three of them? or to just one of them, uh, this is our conversation. Hopefully this has given you some prompting, some context. I've been making a list of questions as we've been going, so uh, I won't hesitate to, uh, to jump in, but uh, who would like to uh, uh, pose a question? My question would be to any of you, and uh, as I was listening to you, I was thinking I, I have a relationship with a young Aboriginal fellow who is in jail for first degree murder and he says he's innocent and um, and actually I believe him. 
But what I was wondering when I was listening to restorative justice is, is there a possibility with restorative justice that the potential for being wrongfully convicted would be less? Like that? Yeah, that's okay. great. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think that when a crime is alleged and there's evidence that leads to someone being charged, it pre. Can you hear me now? Yeah. They. Uh, that requires that a whole process of criminal justice kick in and it precludes the restorative justice process. I think that's what I uh, suggested earlier, that it's they're juxtaposed against each other, uh, diametrically opposed in some cases. If a person's uh, in Canada, if they're charged with an offense, then all of their rights and uh, obligations on the part of peace officers and the courts and all of that kicks in and it kind of precludes the opportunity, except possibly at sentencing, uh, where, you know, obviously at sentencing, offenders and victims could be brought together if they're ready in, in those circumstances. But uh, I would suggest that those circumstances might not be as common as what a lot of people would think as well. So in answer to your question, uh, I don't think so, not the way the system exists as it stands now. Unless you're gonna preclude uh, the justice system, and we do that on a fairly regular basis uh, across Canada, where kids, for instance, uh, the, uh, the uh, Youth Criminal Justice Act doesn't charge kids, no, no child under 12 years old is charged with a crime. Often they're sent to mediation and uh, restorative processes. Uh, a young offender who has no record and a, and a minor offense, often they are diverted from the court system, and, and rightly so, because it, uh, it allows the courts to uh, stop a child from being criminalized and having that burden to set them down that trajectory. I think that there's an opportunity to do a lot more of that in Canada, but uh, it is done quite often, but not in uh, serious offenses in major cases. The whole discussion is, is so terribly complex and I, I don't know where to, where to begin. But I'd like to uh, list out two things. If you talk about crime, we need to talk about poverty. They are so lame. And if you could persuade our politicians not to go on this cheap vote getting uh, track in talking about safety, safe communities, and then having this in mind. Everybody wants safe communities, and they hijack that aspect and build more prison. And that, that's so wrong. I'm really impressed by the work that's being done in Korea in terms of curriculum development, you know, in, in school system particularly in the earlier years. I don't know what's happening later. And, and I'm wondering, two questions, wondering whether there is already some indication of uh, the preventative uh, possibilities, crime preventative possibilities through that kind of educational process. And then my second question would be, are we doing anything in Manitoba in the same direction? That is to say, educational programs in our uh, elementary school systems and in the high school systems that have to do with restorative uh, justice uh, you know, and uh, mediation, learning some skills at conflict resolution. Yeah, well, uh, I go back home and I should uh, teach again that uh, uh, 
Canada is the, one of the leading countries for restorative discipline, because I learned that from books and stuff, and so I have to change it maybe. <laughs> because yeah. um, um, when we do this uh, restorative approach to the, the school settings, it's not always uh, nice and pretty because again, uh, the long history of using uh, corporal punishment, it's very, very deep in the culture. It's only a couple of years that uh, the corporal punishment is officially banned in the school, public schools. Uh, and still we're hearing some news that there's still that approach is continuing. But our question was, Banding the corporal punishment is is good thing, but what's the other ways to deal with it then? The teachers just came to me and said like we are disarmed. So they are in, in confusion and also they are kind of lost way to dealing the behavior issues. So our approach at the beginning was we intervene and we kind of bring the students together and that they share about what happened and how your behavior impact others. That, that was kind of uh, new and powerful because usually there was a separation and deal with the, the wrongdoers usually and the, the victim or students were usually just quiet. But those approach always marked a trauma in both sides and as we heard today it can be cause for a bigger crime or violence in the future. So what we try to do is bring them together and teach them and giving them opportunity to share about the impact of this wrong behavior or wrong doings. Um, I think that is the biggest uh, result that people start to seeing that we have a power to deal with these problems. It's not only authority, it's not only the somebody who come and help us. So to me, that's, that already it's very educational. Um, I think that is the great uh, opportunity, the possibility for the prevention uh, efforts. So, yeah. Jay, can I just ask, Lisa, could you comment on, on the scenario that Jay is just responding to? Because when I hear your story, I hear years before you interacted with the offender. When I hear Jay's story, I hear a day at school, and we're gonna bring these people together. Could you, uh, what's, the, is that a realistic scenario, or what would you, how would you respond to bringing a bully, a, two seven-year-olds together uh, in, in, at a day, you know, in one scenario? Um, I, I think with, um, can you hear me? Okay, um, I think with, young kids in a bullying scenario, I think it is a good idea. I think it's a good idea to, to, to bring them together as quickly as possible so that there isn't the, um, the lasting sense of, of, of anger or um, negative feelings. I think in that way, it's a good idea to, to kind of nip it in the bud, speaking as a mom. Um, and, um, but when it comes to the more serious crimes, that's when it, becomes years of uh, finding your place and figuring out what you can do and what you can handle. And as far as I'm concerned, if it can be done at the seven-year-old and the eight-year-old and the 10-year-old level, you won't have to be doing it nearly as much between uh, you know, victim offenders when it comes to murder and, um, and other assaults and, and, and uh, break and enters and things like that. So I think that it, if it could be done more often, at the school age, it would be far better. And that's, that's where I'd love to see it go. And I don't believe that um, there is a program in Manitoba, an official program for in schools. Bob, can you um, comment on that, about programs in Manitoba, the educational system, to the second part of the question? No, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. Come to the mics uh, if you have further questions. So uh, go ahead, Lisa. Um, just as, uh, as having kids in school, I haven't heard of any official program. I think it depends on the school and I think it depends on who the principal is and whether they want to implement um, some sort of program for that. I don't think that there's an official one. Thank you for coming, firstly. Um, 
my question requires a little bit of preface. Um, it occurs to me that we like to think of our Western justice system as, as fairly dispassionate, fairly logical. Um, there's a natural sort of cause and response approach to crime, um, whereas restorative justice seems to be more emotional, but I wonder if that isn't a bit of a fallacy. It seems to me that our justice system is often motivated by emotions like a sense of, of righteous anger or, or even a vengeful attitude sometimes. So I wonder if, if we find ourselves approaching crime from an emotional perspective regardless of what we would like to do, if, if that's necessary, then how do we as, as citizens with voting power do the work in ourselves to consciously choose our emotional response to crime and to human criminals? What would your takes on that be? Well, I can say yes, there is a lot of passion in the system. And, uh, every, when a police officer starts their career, they, they learn very quickly every call for service that they go to, they're, they're really working for a victim. And it's always a new victim every call, sometimes multiple ones every day. So there is, there is a lot of passion. Um, can you repeat your question, the last part of it? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can clarify. Um, I have participated in a kind of restorative justice type conversation, in which case I was talking with somebody who had, had hurt me, I suppose. Um, and it took me a long time to have that conversation after the initial offense, I suppose. Um, but my openness to having that conversation was modeled to me by my parents, who in my place at the time of the offense um, modeled for me that initial response of, of compassion for a very human criminal, I suppose. It was never reported. Um, so I had that response modeled for me and it allowed me to, to see the possibility of a more compassionate response than a, than a reactive response. And I'm wondering if, if there is work that we as members of a community can do, you know, with voting power to vote in people who will build a more restorative justice system, how do we do the work to, I guess, raise our collective consciousness to a place where we can choose our response to, to criminals? It may not be something you can answer, but I, I just wonder about your thoughts. Yeah, I just lost my uh, train of thought there for a second. But the, uh, what I wanted to say is there's a lot of passion uh, and police officers and the system right through the court process are always working for the victim. But as you become more seasoned, I guess, uh, a little bit more worldly about things, you start to realize that all the offenders are, are themselves victims. We're all victims. Um, but as was pointed out, and, and rightly, some people need to be imprisoned to protect themselves from themselves and to protect society. Some people need to be detained because they have such severe behavior problems. But uh, the system goes too far in that way because there are many people in prison because of the way the system is set up and the principles that it's based on that probably don't need to be, that aren't a danger to society. In, the, in many of those cases, they're imprisoned uh, for the principles of justice rather than community safety. And of course, we all know sentencing principles are deterrence, uh, prevention, and safety of the community. Um, we also know that many crimes that people are arrested for don't have a deterrent effect, even though that's the principle that they're based on. And we know that simply by the fact that we have a high recidivism rate. Um, I know for a fact, and, uh, and I've described in detail in my book, uh, my own experiences where I really felt that it's tragic that kids get in this uh, tragic cycle of going in and out of jail. And it's clear that there's no deterrent effect. In fact, some of them want to go back because that's the only place in life where they can find some structure and maybe some love and support, uh, which is pretty tragic. So I think it goes back to the point that I was trying to make that um, the, the system, the prison system is growing uh, in some cases for the wrong reasons. And we need to work together as a community to be more preventive and get people off on the right foot in life and prevent them from getting involved in the criminal justice uh, path and, and system. So how do we do that? I don't know that um, 
I guess voting for people who understand and appreciate preventive processes and, uh, and a preventive, preventive oriented system. Um, but it's challenging. It's challenging. Uh, the a point that I wanted to make is that I've found, and uh, I'd be interested to hear if, if Jay has found this in Korea and everywhere that he's worked, uh, I find that there's a great deal of apathy among the general public to these issues. I mean, in Canada, we, we have people with, in a country with the high living standard that Canada enjoys, we still have people close to here living on reserves in third world conditions, some with not, uh, you know, poor electricity and insufficient drinking water, which is hard to imagine in a country like Canada. So how we raise awareness and bring people to action about that, uh, I don't know, that's a good question. Just, just to follow up, uh, there was a recent article a couple weeks ago, 66% of the people in the Manitoba's prison system right now are on remand, waiting for bail decisions on trial. So when you talk about the number of people in our prison system who are, are don't necessarily need to be there, these are legally innocent people, 66% of the total population are waiting for a decision about a possible charge. And they are all being housed in our system. So that, that's the extremes of, of, of where we're at right now. Um, Jay, go ahead and comment on... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know it's the mature uh, question, but at home, once in a while, in our mailbox, there is a letter, and we opened it up, and it's, it's from the Ministry of Justice, and it has a picture, and it's the information about this sexual crime who live nearby. And whenever I got that letter, I don't feel safe. I feel actually <laughs> insecure, and I'm thinking like, oh, this guy's living around. And this, it's supposed to be pre preventive approach, but this actually make people put them themselves from distance in the justice system. And thinking that somebody gotta do something. But the program like a COSA, the, the, the circle of support and accountability, the where the community members can join, those are, there are people who brave or interested in these changes they meet these sexual victims and they talk to them and they build a relationship. And actually that makes more safer community than just get this letter and thinking that, oh, we are living in this dangerous society. So the fear, which is created by media or many other facts, and that fear driven this restorative system, and somebody got benefit out of it, I'm sure, but the result is always that we feel insecure. So to me, how we can respond to this, instead of just getting in this letter and just living in the fear, we try to push the program like a COSA. I heard that their funding is cut. <laughs> now their efforts is going down. I think that there's a group need to be raised voice. This is the important and direct way of building safe community. Um, I've heard the remand numbers to be as high as, as above 70%. Um, and, and many people in the system are actually there for, not for criminal activity, but for breaking uh, breaches of parole. For instance, drinking or coming out late for a curfew, which are not actually crimes, but under the conditions. So it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty complex. And I'm wondering how, how restorative justice principles can affect that. But I'm also wondering how um, restorative justice can help us um, reduce or, or, or change our mindset because what we've largely done is criminalize addiction and criminalize indigeneity and criminalize poverty. And, if, uh, and I know there are people who make really, really bad choices and do very evil things, but if you take poverty and indigeneity and, um, uh, and addiction out of the mix, who's, who's in prison? And, uh, and 
I think we have a real failure as a, as a society, and that stems from our legal system, our politicians, the policing system, of we're really good at chasing after those three groups and locking them up. But I'm wondering if we can do better, and I'm wondering what your thoughts on. Comment on that. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, and sometimes people's problems compound based on the original charge, and they get conditions put on them. Uh, we're seeing that in youths, for instance. Sometimes, if they live in a group home, they have a charge, so they're pending a trial uh, on judicial interim release. They have conditions. Then they breach breach the condition. They uh, breach the conditions again and eventually they wind up in more trouble than they were originally over the original charge. So what they're doing in some places in Canada is kids in, uh, in those kind of scenarios in group homes or children in care of the state are not being charged. Uh, they're diverting them to restorative justice or alternative dispute uh, resolution processes, which makes sense, but it does happen with adults as well. Uh, point that I wanted to make, just to your to your point earlier about um, the system drawing things out, I have to say uh, that's a tragic problem in the system that it's so overburdened that sometimes serious, really serious cases, uh, serious charges won't go to trial for three, four, or five years. So the chances of reconciliation when the when the offense was five years ago, I'd say, are slim to none. So the, the accused, the victim, or, and the community don't benefit from a process that takes so long. Uh, and that's a tragic flaw that I think preempts effective conflict resolution or uh, restorative justice. was um, that from an Aboriginal perspective, it would appear as if uh, the justice system now is, uh, uh, is the new face of genocide, in that uh, uh, to live in Manitoba or Saskatchewan as an Indian person uh, is, is very risky. Um, and being poor just adds to that risk. To fear the police, um, I'm grateful that I am a great runner, and I can outrun any police. But uh, I also I'm not a criminal. But uh, um, restorative justice seems to work in uh, small communities, and it's something that uh, government uh, funders are interested in smaller communities. But in Winnipeg. Um, you know, you have a, a segment of the population that have a different world view of how they see themselves. That they see themselves as a community. And uh, perhaps, um, I don't know if the block by block initiative is taking in consideration, but there has been proposal to have a, a, a Cree court in uh, Winnipeg. Um, uh, and whether or not, uh, uh, you know, is anybody open to talking about it or um, willing to consider that perhaps this Aboriginal community in Winnipeg is a community within a community. It's a community that functions uh, inside the community of Winnipeg uh, and perhaps uh, they can resolve uh, their issues. Most of the crimes committed uh, against Aboriginal people are by Aboriginal people. Most of the murders and violent crimes against Aboriginal people are by Aboriginal people. Uh, so perhaps they themselves can resolve, uh, reconcile amongst themselves. Just as an example of uh, hollow water, uh, dealing with the sexual offenses in that community, the community was given an opportunity to resolve their, their uh, as a community. But nobody seems to want to talk about, oh, okay, well, maybe the Aboriginal community can have its own restorative justice process. 
but then uh, we know that there's the issue of racism in, in, in Winnipeg. Um, we know that most people would not want to date an Aboriginal person. Most people would not want to marry an Indian. So I mean, right there, it tells you I mean, we don't have a relationship with the non-Aboriginal community. So why can't we solve our issues and be supported by the non-Aboriginal community? Well, I know there's, there's the Supreme Court Gladue uh, decision that considers if a person has suffered the impacts of colonization and the residential schools and considers uh, Aboriginal issues in sentencing, but that's only in sentencing. I can't speak to how effective that is, but I think the focus needs to be much earlier than that on early childhood development and prevention. And like I said, the police service, uh, I know uh, many in the justice department and government are focusing on early childhood development and crime prevention through social development. Um, it feels like things are going in the right direction, but then again, uh, why do we have so many serious social issues? Because things haven't been addressed decades ago. Jay, can you comment on, uh, you, you talked about reconciling different people groups within your context. What, what are things that are working or that have possibly can give us a picture of, of our own circumstance? Uh, as I shared, uh, if, if understanding of justice is to make a right relationship, uh, I think it applied to all levels. Uh, as I shared that I was in the Palm Maker Reservation for four months, my daily duty or job was hanging out with the, the youth in the reservation who refused to go to schools. Um, so I just hang out with them. And they just call themselves like, Jay, you know, we are savage. We're Indians. I said, what about uh, study and uh, do something, you know, for future? Said, well, I will live here and uh, what should we do, you know? They already live in that box, which I believe is not their choice. So if you live in the very unjust system, how could you have right relationship from the beginning? And I, I heard that the native gardening program that I was in is now no more exist. There's less opportunities the outsiders get into it or inside or out and have a right relationship. When I left the reservation, these kids came to me, some of them full of tears in their eyes saying, Jay, we'll lose friends. So, I don't know, but uh, I think, forget about bring justice into the world, but I think that the easy thing we can start or have, has to be there is understanding and building bridges when there is no bridges or less. Um, so that the people in inside or outside should understand better and share the stories. Um, so, as outsiders, I have no answer, but from my experience in my work, crimes happen in Korea, done by Koreans and done by mm -hmm. uh, for the Koreans. So, it's everywhere. It's the human issues, it's the people issues. I think we have to work together and I believe there are people who have a similar visions and hopes. So I hope this uh, Dove people have a better network and finding good ways to uh, work together. I think we have to do something instead of just sitting and, uh, you know, the, put things inside and just forget about what can you do now. Our time is uh, coming to a close. Lisa, do you have any final reflections or uh, something to pose a question for us to think about? Uh, you talked about that gray line between victim and offender that I know when we got together has stayed with me right from that moment that uh, we often 
see this as an us and them issue. And it was profound for me when you, when you said, I think that, that gap is actually quite small. Um, the gap is actually very small, and it's, it's, it's really quite amazing, but I think that the uh, general public doesn't want to see that because it, then it becomes too real, and the possibility to think of yourself as, as being a possible offender, nobody wants to think that. So they've built up walls, and they've built up literal prisons, and, and they want to keep everything separate, and it becomes an us versus them because you don't want to think of yourself as, as that, as a possibility. But it is an all too real situation where, like I had said to Randy, well, you know, he was hurt, so he hurt someone else. And then I could have hurt someone else and the cycle just keeps on going. And so it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have taken very much for me to become the offender and to be sitting on the other side of the bars. Um, it's, it's basically just, uh, you know, the, the upbringing and the people that, that came into my life kept me from that, and that's the problem, is that there are so many kids and so many people that don't have those people. So um, I'm in incredibly grateful to the people that did step in, 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 our, in our family and in our community. Um, but I, I know that without them, I have no idea where I would be. So my challenge is to everyone to, to look around at the people around you, the kids around you, the teenagers, whoever, and, and say, okay, so what, what can I do instead of looking at, at, at a kid walking down the street and going, ugh, you know, they, they have no respect these days. Well, stop them, talk to them, get involved in something and, and, and find out who they really are and um, bring the walls down. And it t it'll take a long time for that consciousness to change. It's gonna take an enormous amount of time. Um, but as we have these conversations, which I feel are extremely important, as we have these conversations and keep the conversation going, um, and, and show that we've brought down the walls, then we may be able to inspire other people to bring down their walls as well. Let's give our presenters a... I'd like to uh, ask Cheryl Pauls, our president, to uh, make some closing comments. Thanks for coming and for sharing in this conversation in words and in your reflections throughout the evening. Please stick around and uh, meet with our presenters. Um, as I was coming into this evening, I was thinking about ways that we hold on to this and to that at the same time and still find ways forward. And I think we have found lots of hope and I think we're holding on to as well lots of question of way, needing to find ways forward. And, and I'm hoping that through the kinds of conversations uh, that you have with one another in the next few minutes, that, uh, that it's both awakening and refreshing and, um, and, and ways that uh, this particular um, set of people, um, I'm just grateful that, that you're willing to make yourselves both vulnerable and, and take active steps forward and, and hope that each one of us can find one of those for ourselves this evening. So thanks for being here with us and look forward to the conversations we have together tonight. <laughs>